word is important to us. Your word is life and food to us. Your word, Lord, sets us on the path of life. And so, Lord, I'm asking you today, release it in power, God. Release it in power. Let it break strongholds. Let it break, um, let it break through, God. Let it break through. Thank you, Jesus. Jesus was, um, you can turn to Acts 1, by the way. Jesus was just about to ascend into heaven in Acts 1. He'd been crucified, resurrected, had been with the disciples for 40 days, 40 nights, and he's about to ascend into heaven. And according to, if I had added up, if you add in what Paul had to say, there were the disciples that day as he was about to ascend into heaven. They were gathered, and there were about 500 more because the apostle Paul said there were 500 of them that watched him ascend into heaven. So there were 500 plus the, what was left of the disciples, 11 of them after Judas had betrayed. And they're all still hung up on thinking that Jesus is going to be this king that's going to reestablish the kingdom of Israel, that's going to exalt them to the head of the nations and inaugurate a new social order and all that kind of stuff. That's what they're thinking. They haven't yet understood what he was really about. And so in chapter 1, verse 6, when they had come together, they were asking him, saying, Lord, is it at this time you're restoring the kingdom to Israel? Are you going to do it now? And Jesus basically responded in the way he did sometimes. Jesus wasn't always nice. Basically, he said, that's not your business. That's not for you to know. But here's what I do want you to know. Here's what I am going to do. Verse 8, but you will receive power when the Holy Spirit has come upon you. And you shall be my witnesses, both in Jerusalem and in all Judea and Samaria, and even to the remotest part of the earth. And with that, he ascended into heaven. Now, I wonder, I wonder what was actually going through their heads when Jesus said that. What did they actually hear in what Jesus had just said? What, did they, what actually went into their heads and hearts? And I wonder, did they only hear the power part? Was that all they really heard? Did they understand the part about being his witnesses? Did they understand the part about going to the nations? Did they, did they get any of that? How much of it did they really get and understand? But they'd been told to wait until the power came. That much they got. And so, verse 13, when they had entered the city, they went up to the upper room where they were staying, that is, Peter and, Jan and John and James and Andrew, Philip and Thomas, Bartholomew and Matthew, James the son of Alphaeus, Simon the zealot and Judas, the son of James. These all with one mind were continually devoting themselves to prayer along with the women and Mary, the mother of Jesus, and with his brothers. Now, did they know what to pray? They're about to embark on this huge prayer meeting. Did they know what to pray? Did they know how to pray? What happened there in the upper room when they were praying? What happened? And I see several simple things for starters. It says they came together in a single location. They came together in a single location, that upper room. The upper room that had been home to the disciples. And so they weren't isolated from one another praying at home. By the way, this is called pre-revival prayer. That's the title of the sermon, pre-revival prayer. They weren't isolated praying at home alone. There was connection. There's a, there's a strength that comes from being physically with others in the presence of the Lord, seeking Him together. Every revival that I know of in history began when a group of people came together in one place and cried out to God. Amen. Second thing was that they, they prayed with one mind. So there was unity. There was oneness. And it was unity across a broad age range. Listen to this one. They were Peter. Peter was probably older because he had a wife. Probably wasn't as young as the rest of the disciples. The others, the remaining 11 disciples, they were perhaps early to mid-20s. Jesus' brothers were probably in their 30s because Jesus was. Jesus' mother, who was, by that, was there, she was at least by that time in her 50s. Now that is ancient in that world because people didn't have very long lifespans. So she's the senior citizen there. So there's this range of ages going on. And they were united. They were focused in one place. 
And at least in that day for this purpose, they didn't separate out into a seniors group and a young adult group and a youth group and a women's group and a men's group. They did this together, crying out for revival. United front. And the third thing is they were continually devoting themselves to prayer. Continually devoting themselves to prayer. And so it didn't stop. It was constant. It was disciplined. It was persistent. And that prayer meeting went on for 10 days. From, from Passover to Jesus ascending into heaven, that was 40 days and 40 nights after the resurrection. And from Passover to the Feast of Pentecost, when the Holy Spirit was outpoured, that was 50 days. And so you do the math. 50 minus 40 makes 10. And so they have this 10-day prayer meeting. That's a little daunting for me because I'm done in 10 minutes. I don't know what else to say. I've said it. What do I do now? That's me. <laughs> One difference between them and us, I think, when they're doing this 10 minute or 10 minute, 10 day prayer meeting, one difference between them and us as we seek the Lord is that at least the 11 and some of them that had been with them had apparently been in full time Christian, full time ministry for several years and they had no jobs to go to now. So they could linger, they could be there all the time. As they prayed, more and more people gathered to them until, at verse 15, there were about 120 of them. Now, I have no doubt, I'm reading into this, and the reason I read a little bit into it is that the Bible only tells us as much of the story as can fit onto a scroll. What you don't get is 240 pages and 55,000 words because a scroll wouldn't hold that much. And so you kind of get sketches. So there were about 120. I have no doubt that a whole lot of that 120 were kind of in and out during the week because they had jobs to go to and they had businesses to run. But the point is that they were all focused in unity, all in one place, crying out for whatever it was they cried out for. What did they pray for during that period of time? It was sustained and extended. It was devoted prayer. It was united prayer across a, across a wide age range. Men and women gathered prayer. And it was prayer that was based on a promise. How many of you know that prayer works best when you're praying based on a promise? It was based on a promise. Jesus promised they'd receive power. And he promised that they'd receive a destiny, a destiny based on that power and enabled by that power. You're going to be my witnesses in the whole world. You're going to tell people what I'm like. But what did they pray? What was the content? We know the outcome. We're going to read that in a minute, but what was the content? So listen carefully. Chapter 2, verse 1. When the day of Pentecost had come, they were all together in one place. All together in one place. God doesn't, God doesn't pour out a full and complete Pentecostal outpouring and empowering on just a segment of a particular body of Christ. The fullness comes when there's one mind and when the people are gathered in one place. That's when the fullness comes. And by the way, I just want to ask you, I, I didn't say this earlier, but it's kind of on me right now. I, I would appreciate your prayers as I preach because I've... I'm one of those guys that's pre-diabetic and I've been fasting off and on all week and all of a sudden my blood sugar is in the basement and my head is spinning. Kind of weak and shaky. So, But there's power that comes when you offer a sacrifice to God in prayer. And that's what fasting is. So the power came when they were all gathered together in one place. There's this unity going on after 10 days of prayer. Why pour out the power after 10 days? Why not send the power the moment he ascended? I mean, he could have poured out power on 500 and some people all at one time if he'd said, I'm going to give you power, um, boom, here, have it, and then he leaves. Why say, wait in Jerusalem? And he didn't even tell them how long. Wait in Jerusalem till the power comes. Why not... And, and, and he had to know there wouldn't be as many there. I mean, isn't God the good showman? You know, doesn't he know anything about marketing? 
<laughs> I mean, come on. So they, he, he waits until there's just this 120. Why was that necessary? I ask these questions. Why was, you know, when you read the scripture, ask questions. Why was that necessary? Well, because there was work to do. What did they pray? And then you begin to sew the, 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 the pearls together. You begin to sew the pieces together. And I think that it probably started with what Jesus prayed before he was crucified, what Jesus did before he was, before he was crucified. In John 17, he prayed that they may all be one as we are one. Jesus prayed for oneness. He prayed for unity. What did the 120 pray? Well, you know what? I'd have a hard time thinking that they just repeated send the power over and over again for 10 days. And I know they didn't pray the Lord's Prayer 290,000 times over and over again. What did they pray? Well, there seemed to be an emphasis that Jesus had given them on oneness. There seemed to be this emphasis on unity, both in what Jesus prayed and in the account of how the 120 prayed here, ended up here in, in Acts. So that's probably the best place to start. And when I read the Gospels, I realized they were trying, listen, I said this before, they were trying to condense three and a half years of ministry and experience onto some very limited scrolls. You could only put so much on a scroll. You wonder how much a scroll would hold. That's why we only have 28 chapters in Matthew for instance, because that's all a scroll could take. And so they had to condense everything down. Not 248 pages and 55,000 words. So what we read there, what we read in the Gospels, and what we read in the book of Acts, that's just a representative sketch. It's just a condensation. It's snapshots of what went on that give us a flavor and a taste. It's a summary. The last verse of the Gospel of Luke says, this is Luke 21, 25. And there are also many other things which Jesus did, which if they were written in detail, I suppose that even the world itself would not contain the books that would be written. So this is, it's a condensation. It's not the whole story. And so we're left to fill in the blanks. And we fill in the blanks with what we know of human nature and human relationships sometimes. And so here's the question. Was walking with Jesus... For three and a half years, a walk through the daisies. No. Isn't it wonderful? I'm with Jesus. Was it, was it all full of joy and wonder all the time? Was it, for the disciples, was it, these are the most wonderful people I've ever known. We always get along, and it's just a tremendous privilege to be with them. No. Maybe Sometimes. But there were all the times that Jesus got upset with them. All the times that Jesus had to rebuke them and, and accuse them of having little faith. And, and, and man, if you read the words, he's not happy with them. He's irritated. And the people that he gathered to follow him around, they were no great prizes. So then there's this. Listen to this. Mark chapter 9, verse 33. They came to Capernaum. And when he was in the house, he began to question them. What were you discussing on the way? But they kept silent, for on the way they had discussed with one another <coughs> which of them was the greatest. Busted! I ain't saying nothing. And sitting down, he called the twelve and said to them, If anyone wants to be first, he shall be last of all and servant of all. And then it got worse. This is Mark. Chapter 10, verse 35, James and John, the two sons of Zebedee, came up to Jesus saying, Teacher, we want you to do for us whatever we ask of you. Let's just start with a manipulative question, why don't we? And he said to them, What do you want me to do for you? And they said, Grant that we may sit, one on your right and one on your left, in your glory. We want to be the vice president and the prime minister. But Jesus said to them, you do not know what you're asking. Are you able to drink the cup that I drink or to be baptized with the baptism with which I'm baptized? And they said to him, we're able. You don't know who you're dealing with. <laughs> and Jesus said to them, the cup that I drink, you shall drink. And you shall be baptized with the baptism with which I'm baptized. But to sit on my right or on my left, this is not mine to give but it is for those for whom it has been prepared. And hearing this, the ten 
the others began to feel indignant with James and John. Which means they had some arguments. Which means there was a division in the body. Those guys, they don't have a clean spirit. What's the matter with them? Snapshot. How many other tensions and disputes? Luke has a different story, same point, chapter 22, verse 23. And they began to discuss among themselves which one of them it might be who was going to do this thing. They were looking forward to the disaster. And there arose also a dispute among them as to which one of them was regarded to be the greatest. So now we're arguing about who's the most anointed. No, it's me. No, it's Peter. No, 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 it's John. Which one of them is the greatest? Which one is the most anointed? Which one do we like best? James and John, they couldn't get through to Jesus confronting him directly, so they went and got their mom. She's cute and sweet. Maybe she'll get through to Jesus. And so their mother comes to Jesus and bows down. She's all humble. You know, Jesus, could my son sit on your right and on your left? You know. Jesus knew they had put her up to it. And so in the next few verses, he's rebuking them again for the same thing. So Jesus <laughs> rebukes them. They've been fighting among themselves. He explains how it's really supposed to be. Well, after all of that, and when they've been indignant with each other and stuff, did they all just shrug their shoulders and say, okay, we're good, we're cool, we're all healed? And then walk away all cleansed and happy with each other? Is that what people do? No. I, knew, I, I, I mean, I, I know human nature too well to, to, to believe that. I know that if it's not really talked out and it's not really released, every situation like that leaves a residue. It leaves something lingering in the relationship. I have no doubt at all that some elements of those disputes and their senses of offense or trust of one another carried forward. Some lingering defilement carried forward. And then there were all the times when they wanted to call fire from heaven to consume sinners because they just didn't get what kind of spirit Jesus was giving them. Didn't understand him. And I know, that, I know that character traits and bad attitudes don't normally evaporate overnight, do they? It takes time. Character tra- shifts in character develop and they grow. Kind of, They don't happen instantly. And there was the time that they, that, that, that they were rebuking the children from coming to Jesus and Jesus had to deal with them kind of harshly about it. You know, if you really read the scripture, Jesus didn't, you know, walk around saying, oh, children, play nice. There were times when he was kind of harsh, rebuked them kind of loudly and angrily. So these are snapshots. These are little pictures that, that kind of represent a host of moments in this multi-year story. There's moments when they were not one with each other, moments of of arguments, moments when imperfect human beings didn't get it, and they did, and they said offensive, hurtful things to each other. Like when they were debating who was the greatest and vying for position. There are times today when people begin to compare anointings. Who's the greatest? Who has it? Who doesn't? Who's the most important? Happens today in the body of Christ, and it happens in our midst. Looking back through history, you get the, the great Azusa Street Revival. That was, that was the one. It went on for three and a half years. That was the one where if they had fewer than a dozen miraculous healings in a day, they thought it was a bad day. That was the one where the glory cloud never left. Visible. That was the one that launched the great Pentecostal revival all over the world. It's probably the greatest outpouring of the Spirit in the last 150 to 200 years. You know how it died? It died when they began to compare anointings. They divided among themselves, killed the revival when one thought he was greater in the anointing or he thought he was better able than the next one to lead it. Factions gathered around those people. And then William Seymour, who had been the leader of it from the beginning, died a man who believed that he had failed. 
lot of people don't tell that part of the story. So it can be who gets recognized and who doesn't. Who gets a position, who doesn't. Who gets chosen for the team and who doesn't. Who's the most popular, who isn't. When I think about the move of the Spirit, I think, I think when God moves, we ought to be humbled by that, not exalted or made prideful. Revivals die when that gets missed. And, and we've seen that happen right here in our own church over our 24-year history. I think there was even more to it in those 10 days of prayer. Unclean things took root in the disciples when they misunderstood one another. And they didn't hear what one another was saying. Or they heard and took offense at what they heard, careless words, hurtful words. Moments when they took offense at each other's attitudes. Moments, I wonder, when they were maybe ashamed of one of their number because of some stupid act or some stupid word that was spoken. Oh, there goes Peter again, you know what he's like. Back in John 20, I'm building up to what they prayed for the 10 days. Back in John 20, Jesus was preparing them for his ascension when they would see him no more. He was getting them ready. Getting them ready for the outpouring of power that was coming because he knew what they were like. He knew what their relationships had been. He knew what had been built up over the years. And so he did something to them that I think had a double edge, meaning it had applications to two different settings. And here it is, John chapter 20, starting at verse 21. Jesus said to them again, Peace be with you, as the Father has sent me, I also send you. This is after his resurrection, and he's appearing to them over the 40 days. And when he had said this, he breathed on them and said to them, Receive the Holy Spirit. If you forgive the sins of any, their sins have been forgiven them. If you retain the sins of any, they've been retained. And the double edge is this. The double edge is first that they were being sent to conquer sin in others as they would minister the power of Jesus. Second, they were commissioned and empowered by the Holy Spirit to deal with sin and brokenness among themselves, to repair relationships. And so there were two givings of the Holy Spirit in Scripture. The first was for dealing with sin and with cleansing the heart and healing the relationships. And it was a recreation, like in Genesis. Genesis 1, God breathes into Adam's nostrils the, the breath of life, and Adam becomes a living soul. Recreate, and, and, and here, he breathes on them again. It's a recreation. It's, 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 a, it's a new start. The second outpouring of the Spirit was in Acts 2, for power. The first is for cleansing. Second is for power. But the gift of power was necessarily preceded by the gift for cleansing from sin. Every real historical revival has been birthed in repentance. Every real historical revival was sustained in prayer that included repentance. It was never just God send revival. It was God cleanse us. God change us. God forgive us. I rewind, rewind my own life the time, everything, there was a, when I started in ministry, very long time ago, <laughs> when I started in ministry, everything I touched turned to gold. Youth revival followed me everywhere I went. I was a kid magnet. Youth fell all over themselves to get saved and grow in the Lord. And the adults that I would minister to and preach to, I had a senior pastor who had a nervous breakdown, had to leave, and there was a gap before they brought the next senior pastor. So I ended up filling the pulpit. And the adults that I ministered to and preached to when, when, when he was out or he fell ill thought I was the greatest thing ever. And it was so good, I started thinking I was all that in a bag of chips. God's with me, man. And I remember beginning to think, I thought my life was pure. I couldn't think of any real sin in me. My heart's clean. My heart's right. I'm strong. And then all those folks that struggled, you know, and didn't walk like I did or didn't get the success that I did, well, they, they um, or people that were kind of defiled, you know, not as blessed as me, they, they just need to be like me. What's the matter with you? It wasn't long after that the Lord blew it all away. I mean blew it all away. Dried it up. And I got a revelation of who I'm really not. 
kind of like Isaiah, when the veil between the spiritual realm and the earthly realm opened up, and all of a sudden he, he, he got a vision of the heavenly temple, and, the, and, and he saw the Lord and his glory. Isaiah 6, 5, woe is, this is his response. Woe is me, I'm ruined. Because I'm a man of unclean lips. I live among a people of unclean lips. My eyes have seen the King, the Lord of hosts. And it says that a winged seraph flew to him with a burning coal from the altar and touched his lips and cleansed him. And I, and I say, thank God, thank Jesus that he's cleansed me and that he's cleansed you. But I can never plead innocent. I can never say apart from Jesus that my heart is clean or that there's nothing in my heart that isn't, that isn't holy or pure. I can, never, I can never say, wow, I'm so anointed because I'm not. It's the Lord's anointing and He can give it, He can take it at will because it doesn't belong to me. So what did the 120 pray during that 10 days? Well, repentance had to be a major focus. They had to be paying a lot of attention to taking authority over sin because that's what they'd been commissioned to do. Well, what kind of sin? I don't think any of them were fornicators or adulterers at that point. That had already been dealt with. I don't believe any of them were dealing with addiction problems. You don't, you don't follow Jesus and, and, and drunk. I mean, that doesn't work. You don't follow Jesus around for three and a half years and stay the course if you're inebriated. Just being in his presence would change all that. None of them were thieves. None of them were liars. You know, hanging out with Jesus, it just, that had eliminated all that. What was left was that they had, they had to come to unity with each other. They had to come to a sense of oneness. God will not come or stay for division. He won't bless or empower anything for very long that doesn't look like him and his essence is oneness. That they may be one as we are one, he prayed. The three who are one. One God in three persons. And there's a price to be paid for that oneness. And Jesus said it. No greater love has any man than this, that he lay down his life for his friends. That's the price. I guarantee that whatever reason any of us might hold in the heart that might seem righteous or justified for standing apart from oneness, from honor, and from unity or contributing to division in any form, you are wrong in it. End of story. End of story. God doesn't respect it, and God will not bless it. And so I think they laid a lot of things down as they prayed in those ten days. I think there was a lot of facing themselves honestly. I think there was a lot of seeking the real fruit of the Spirit. I think they had to come to a place where they looked past the flaws in one another and they began to honor the presence of God in each believer. He is our unity. His person. His presence. Not, not some mysterious state where everybody thinks the same thing or where none of us ever fails or we never speak a wrong word, or we like the same music, or we bond to the same leader, or we even understand one another with any depth. That's all human stuff, and it will fail. And so we lay that down for one another. We make that sacrifice. We live to bless. We live to honor. We live to lift. We live to encourage and if that means we have to surrender something to do it, then we do it because it's love. And it's the spirit of honor, oneness, unity has its root in honor given. That's where the power begins to flow, when there's an honor given to one another. Not even Jesus in his hometown could function in full miracle power when his people would not honor him. It shut Jesus down. Honor rendered first to leaders and then to one another. Here's one. Hebrews chapter 13, 16 and 17. Do not neglect doing good and sharing, for with such sacrifices God is pleased. Obey your leaders and submit to them, for they keep watch over your souls as those who will give an account. Let them do this with joy and not with grief, 
for this would be unprofitable for you. And what he's saying there is fail in honor given and everybody loses. Anointing dies, blessing is cut off. But it's not just leaders we're called to honor. Hebrews 10, 24, 25. Let us consider how to stimulate one another to love and good deeds, not forsaking our own assembling together, as is the habit of some, but encouraging one another and all the more as you see the day drawing near. In other words, as you see the end times approaching, it becomes more and more important that we consider, we think about, we work at encouraging one another, lifting one another up, affirming one another. Those are forms of honor given, and honor brings oneness. It's, honor is the glue that holds it together in the Lord. It's the platform on which anointing and blessing rest. When they were disputing among themselves about who was the greatest, they were dishonoring both one another and the Lord. They were diminishing one another in order to exalt themselves. What did they pray in those 10 days? Fill in the blank. Back to John again. When he had said this, he breathed on them and said, Receive the Holy Spirit. If you forgive the sins of any, their sins have been forgiven them. If you retain the sins of any, they've been retained. And by the way, the word retain, I never could figure that out. It didn't make any sense to me. Why would I want to tell you that you're stuck with your sin? You know, you I forgive, but you, you're stuck with yours. Why, why, that didn't make any sense. The word retain in the Greek really means to seize and hurl. I'm going to take hold of it and I'm going to hurl it because I don't want anything to do with it. I'm going to take hold of brokenness in relationship and seize it and hurl it because I don't want anything to do with it. We've been given, we've been given authority and power to do that. So my, by my estimation, within days of Jesus breathing on them that way, that was exactly what they were doing. They were addressing holes in the relationships. They were addressing seeds of disunity and brokenness until it brought oneness. And when there was a clean sense of oneness, then the power fell. Acts chapter 2 again. When the day of Pentecost had come, they were all together in one place, and suddenly there came from heaven a noise like a violent rushing wind, and it filled the whole house where they were sitting. And there appeared to them tongues as of fire distributing themselves, and they rested on each one of them. And they were all filled with the Holy Spirit and began to speak with other tongues as the Spirit was giving them utterance. And they didn't hide it. They, they, they took it right out into the street where people could see and hear. And it was, you know, not like here. We'd go out here and the neighbors would all kind of come to their windows and look and say, those people are nuts. But back then, Pentecost was one of the required feasts of the Jews. And it was even better attended than Passover because it was held at a time of year when travel was easier. And so Jerusalem was jam-packed with people, elbow to elbow, crowding the streets, side to side. And so they pour out into the street. They're speaking in tongues, languages they don't understand. But these people from all over the world, they're speaking all these foreign languages and they're hearing these stupid Galileans who have no education speaking their languages miraculously, praising God. And they thought some of them were drunk because they were staggering around under the power. Acts 2.13, others were mocking and saying they're full of sweet wine. And Peter stands up, he explains it all, points to Jesus, calls for repentance and baptism, and 3,000 people got added to the kingdom of God that day. Now, that's revival. I don't know how hungry each of us in this place is as, as an individual for God. And I'm not in any position to judge that in, in anybody sitting here. I know that many of us are filled with fire, though. I know many of us are burning up inside. Many of us are so full of passion for Jesus we can hardly stand ourselves. I know we're desperate for the fullness. I know that we're hungry. I also know that we're not so unified or of one mind as we have been called to be. And I know that the reasons are unholy. I ask only that every one of us examine, everyone examine your own heart and see what Holy Spirit reveals. Because part one to revival is John 20, to take authority over all that's unholy, take authority over all that divides by coming before the Lord for cleansing and repentance. And part two is to come to unity and receive the power to be all we've been called to be. And then a move of God comes that shakes a nation shakes a nation. And I haven't been real sure how to end the service today, but this is the picture I had as I was getting the sermon ready. 
I've never been one to even pray on my knees. It's never been a comfortable position for me. And I came into the sanctuary this week, and some things were very much on my heart, to sit down and pray where I'd be comfortable. And the Lord said, no. I thought, okay, I'll kneel. And the Lord said, no. He said, I want you on your face. And so I laid in here and sucked carpet for about a half an hour before the Lord. And that was the vision, that was the picture I had as I was preparing this message. And it may be a very unusual way to end a service. But um, I'm going to my knees. <laughs> I want to ask you to join me. And do what we have to do. I'm turning 65 in September and I'm not going to go to my grave without seeing Pentecost happen in my lifetime. Amen. Not going to happen. Not going to happen. So I'm just going to ask Marty to put on some music and if you want to come suck some carpet with me, you're welcome to do that. Amen.